Empire. Rankings matter where betting markets exist. Where uh, sportsbooks uh, head office, uh, global companies might be European centric or in the in the UK. Yeah. Uh, but they need to have a localized product, so to expand beyond the EPL and the Big Five and really offer that depth of, of market and coverage to uh, uh, reach and appeal to those local local companies. That's Mike Adams, co-founder of Keras, a technology group who is helping set markets throughout the sporting globe. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. In this connected world, believe it or not, there are still blind spots for finding talent and setting markets in the ever-expanding gaming and gambling space. And that's where Keras seeks to bridge all of those gaps. Our guest this week is Mike Adams. He's the co-founder of Keras, which is a predictive analytics company that specializes in global sporting markets. Hi, Mike. How are you? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, very good, Bram. Uh, great to, to be here with you today. Uh, let's start with what the company does. Can you tell us what Keras does? Yeah, so we are uh, simply a technology and predictive analytics firm. So we've developed our own tech, uh, our own models, and the context that we operate in is the, the sporting markets. So we provide uh, predictions for soccer exclusively. Uh, those predictions are currently consumed by two types of clients at the moment. So we have uh, sports books. So we supply those predictions in the forms of odds for additional derivative markets that they would offer to their customers. And uh, more recently, we've got a, a new vertical where we supply our data and models to soccer clubs. So they can leverage that information in their decision making, whether it be for uh, club strategy or, or transfers. Okay. Tell me a little bit about the technology and let's start with the idea of the sports books, which obviously are setting markets. What is different about the technology that you've created that they are interested in and working with? Yeah. So we've developed for the purpose of the uh, delivery of odds for sports books, uh, low latency technology that uh, expands across a range of geographical regions. So we can provide markets, derivative markets in, in soccer that's applicable for let's say, lower league uh, South American soccer, where the quality of the prices, the quality of our models, and the quality of the products the bookmaker can offer is on a par with EPL, for example. So there's a big trend in, in sports betting as um, other jurisdictions regulate and markets in South America become regulated, or, or more recently, uh, USA after the PASPA appeal, where uh, sports books uh, head office, uh, global companies might be European-centric, or in the, in the UK, yeah. uh, but they need to have a localized product. So to expand beyond the EPL and the big five and really offer that depth of, of market and coverage to uh, uh, reach and appeal to those local local customers. Are there large, uh, I guess the answer is yes, since you're supplying this technology, are there large audiences and markets for these lower tier leagues? Yeah, it's, it's very different region by region. So in Africa, for example, there's a real big demand for, for EPL, uh, and big five leagues. There's not so much of a demand for those kind of local South African Premier League type, type markets. But if you go to, to LATAM, there's a real demand for those local markets, the, the, the passion and investment in their local teams, their local leagues. So they want to have a goal scorer bet on, on the Chilean second tier and not just follow the EPL uh, uh, with, with that bet. Okay. And let's talk about the technology as used by teams. Could you take us through a little bit of how you all thought through what you would supply to teams for their use? Yeah. So we've been supplying for, uh, to sports books for the past kind of four or five years. And it became apparent as the evolution in, in sports, the evolution in uh, data and analytics in, in sports and soccer, particularly, uh, the application of some of our insights is actually quite fitting to, to add value to that uh, consumption of, of data and analytics for clubs. So we, we've seen this wonderful uh, evolution, I suppose, of, of data in sports that kind of mirrors data in society, right? The uh, collection and harvesting of a larger volume of data, uh, the analysis and insights derived from that data, and then the impact and the actions that, that clubs are um, you know, seeing after leveraging that data. So we see the, the game evolve. 
Uh, there's a fantastic example in the NBA, actually, that your, uh, your listeners might be more familiar with, where that heat map, if you look at a heat map, a, a, a shot heat map, sorry, from yes. 20 years ago, and then shows that on, on today's heat map, and those low-value two-pointers uh, close to the, the three-point line have been eradicated because they have a low expected value, and it's more optimal to, to take a three-point. So that's from a, a, a volume and a presence of data, insights, and then actions. So as we look at, at soccer, the sport that we're kind of experts in at the moment, and the predictions that we are producing with, with our models and those insights, there's a, there's a real trajectory in this kind of timeline of data that, that is quite fitting now for us to be able to provide those, um, uh, yeah, those insights and data points to clubs as they continue this journey of uh, using data and analytics. You know, what's really interesting about what you're telling me right now, we've talked to a lot of different founders of data analytics, some in the gambling markets and some that are doing it mainly for players and teams and strategy and performance based. Yours is almost going backwards from the way that we're accustomed to hearing about it. We hear about data analytics being provided to players and teams and then sports books maybe utilizing them to kind of refine their markets. Yours seems to have gone backwards where you went almost to the books first and the team saw value in that, which it's an interesting dynamic that you have going on here. Yeah, exactly that. And actually you can draw parallels to that journey with some of the more successful clubs um, who have adopted data uh, over these last kind of 10, 15 years. So you look at the Brighton, the, the journey of Brighton, journey of Brentford, those uh, models, those insights, the data that those clubs are now using to uh, achieve a competitive edge uh, across their leagues were originally created to, to, to beat the betting markets 15, 20 years ago. So what we're trying to do is a similar journey where clubs can now leverage the um, yeah, similar process, the similar insights, the similar um, uh, objective um, predictions to then apply to their club strategy, their transfer strategy, and complement those uh, data sets that they're already using. Future Sport is a presentation of Empire Media, a B2B and B2C podcast and digital company dedicated to making your business or brand be heard. Internal or external content creation that will have a lasting impact on your strategy, consulting, creation, and production, all to help you effectively communicate your message in any marketplace. Learn more at empiremedia.com, A-M-P-I-R-E media.com. What could you share about what teams want to know about their strategy and their players without giving up too much of the pri- of the proprietary information? Yeah, so it's so a great example, a great use case. Uh, a, a club at the beginning of any season or you know, uh, in a timeline of a club, clubs will always have, like any business, uh, a long-term goal or strategy. And they'll break that down to shorter-term goals, which may encompass a, a season, right? So what, what's your goal as a club for this season? Let's say it's promotion. Okay, so what objectives are they looking at to achieve that goal? Well, maybe at the moment it's kind of goal difference. They know they need to get a certain positive goal difference. Uh, And maybe if they're using some good data sets, they might look at their their XG. What we can actually do is provide a simulation of the season ahead, give them an accurate percentage prediction for what the likelihood at the moment is of them achieving that goal, and then start to build a strategy for tracking performance against that percentage. So they might play the first eight games of the season. Uh, It might be a really tough schedule and um, they've lost four of those eight. But actually, because of how tough their schedule was, their percentage chance of achieving that promotion goal has not dipped significantly. Whereas at the moment, they might perceive it has. So we're adding another layer of intelligence, I suppose, into what clubs are already doing. Okay. Um, You use ratings for the teams. Um, can you kind of just tell me how you've come around to coming up with a rating system for teams and players? Yeah, really good, uh, really good question to go down. There's uh, three elements to our uh, team ratings and how we derive those, those model numbers. So we look at from a team level, what happens on the pitch, um, how teams perform, what the situation of that performance is, like were they trailing, were they leading, did their opponents have a man sent off? What was the situation of the game as it played out? And then that culminates in a, what we determine as a, a fair score for that game. So if that game was simulated a million times, 
what would the average score be? So that's that's one element of the model. Then we have player a player model, which is kind of a bottom up uh, input. We look at what the players have done individually and how their performance uh, compared to their to, you know, their opponents. How how good was the player performance? And then the final element to our model is the ex what we call the external variables. So that's looking at the situation around the match. Where where was it played? How far did the away team have to travel? What was the schedule of the two teams going into that match? What's the weather situation? What's the pitch condition? So all of these external variables that can influence performance, you know, for or against. And then we can normalize all of that and come out with that kind of fair score to get a really accurate uh, uh, conclusion of how well team A plays uh, relative to team B. And then that culminates itself in, in team ratings across the league. So you know how good your team is against the, the opposition. Okay, so let me stay on the external stuff for a moment. That's interesting that you're trying to quantify that. Like what what role does that have on outcomes? Because all the internal stuff, there's plenty of data that can be collected on pace of play, uh, all, the, all the moments that you're talking about that occur literally in a match. But it is hard to put a quantification on rain, travel, schedule leading into it, how are you all thinking about how to weigh external factors so that they either aren't weighted too heavily in how you rate a team or too lightly in how you rate a team? Yeah, so we try to isolate each variable to, to give it a value. So it's so a great process that we went through was determining altitudes. We, we have a lot of coverage in South America, LATAM, and compared to Europe, those are fixtures and leagues that are heavily impacted by altitude. So in Peru, for example, or Bolivia, the highest teams might play at 4,000 meters above sea level. And then there's some teams that play at sea level. So there's this huge disparity. And, and that can have a really significant impact on, on performance. So a team goes from sea level to 4,000 meters, it degrades their performance and potentially when they, they come down as well. So we isolate removing that as a variable to try and isolate it from performance and, and get a value for how much that change in altitude impacts performance over a big enough number of matches. And you can draw essentially, you know, it's a logarithmic line through zero meters change in, in altitude to 4,000 meters. And, yeah. you, and you can get a really high confidence relationship of how that impacts performance. Um, how are you going about collecting all the data? I assume you don't have video technology in all of these different leagues all over the world. So, so what is your process to collect all this data that you're you're trying to quantify? Yeah, so so we have a few different inputs, but the primary one would be one of the um, commercial data feeds that actually does have really broad coverage. So some of those companies that are out there collecting pack packaging and, and supplying data would have you know, 100, 150 leagues uh, across their um, their platform. So, and, and that speaks to the prevalence you know, of, of data in professional sports these days, whether it's the Cambodian Premier League, the Bolivian Premier League, these games are being watched, the data's being collected. So there's a certain level and depth of, of data, even in those smaller, more obscure leagues. All right, let me um, end with just a very broad question, which is gonna be hard to answer, but you'll take it wherever you want to. Where's this all going? Like what what's next in in the in this pursuit of more refined data collection? Yeah, so the, I suppose the most recent uh, developments or the or the uh, the space that's kind of leading uh, the evolution at the moment would be computer vision, uh, artificial intelligent models absorbing that computer vision, starting to uh, try to evaluate off ball uh, and spatial value. So at, a, at the data journey at the moment, it's event data that, that's um, kind of progressed the journey, right? What happens on the ball? What's an action on the ball? How much is that worth? Well, now we're going beyond that and looking at uh, the, the industry as a, as a whole, going beyond that, trying to identify what's the value that a, a space that a create, player creates? How much is that run worth even if he never touches the ball in a sequence of possession well was there a positive expected value of the space that he created for himself or for his teammates and how did that impact the opposition um, and i suppose that leads to in a few years we've got quantum computing on the horizon that once the hardware is at a certain point that will start to really uh, escalate the, the the pace of, uh, of that kind of analysis mike adams is the co-founder of Keras. thank you so much for joining us great to be with you thanks 
on the next Future Sport Podcast. How you will watch sports is constantly changing. So now we're thinking about it from a team uh, perspective. Well, what the team really wants is looking at reaching the maximum number of audience. And therefore, one of the models that emerged that we've been supporting is what people now call the beam and stream model where in a way you sort of almost go back in time and you you make a deal with an over-the-air provider because there's people who like to sort of watch content in that way and it obviously allows you to reach a much wider audience than you would with people who have a cable subscription. That's Wim Sweldon's co-founder and CMO of Kizwi, who is helping teams and leagues navigate the technological advances, in-game presentation and fan connection. That will do it for this episode. As always, the future is now. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein.